Shalom. My name is Adam, and I welcome you to the parable of the vineyard. Every day, Yahuwah is waking up a remnant, a group of people who are coming out of deceptions, realizing our walk is to consist of faith and obedience to His righteous commands. Each week, we read through and examine a portion of the Torah, allowing the Spirit of the Most High to guide, teach, and open our eyes and ears to the wondrous matters out of His law. Join us as we seek to be refined by His Word, preparing ourselves for the return of our King of Kings, being faithful and obedient, walking in His way, truth, and life. Shabbat Shalom and welcome back, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the Parable of the Vineyard YouTube tour portion live stream. We are in week 22, Vayachel, which is, and he assembled. And this is Exodus 35, 1 through 38, 20. I should just read on the screen, 38, 20. And, um, you know, interesting tour portion. Um, you know, most of it is the erecting of, of the tabernacle. So not a ton of stuff to really dig into, but uh, there are a few points that uh, are really interesting here. And I want to talk about um, really kind of digging out of the traditions of men that have really plagued um, the Torah keeping world. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But uh, before we get started, I just wanted to just mention out there that in case you're you're new to the uh, this ministry or just stumbling across this uh, Torah portion randomly. Um, these are studies. I don't consider myself a Torah teacher. I am a uh, disciple of Messiah, uh, a believer in the Most High, and I believe it is our duty to keep the Torah uh, to the best of our ability, knowing that we're in dispersion and uh, that we can't keep every single one. But when we look through these things, we look at Hey, what can we keep? I think that's the attitude that we should have rather than, ah, we can't keep the whole law, so let's just toss it all out. I think we should look into it and say, hey, can we keep this one? Yeah. Can we keep that one? Yeah. Can we keep, keep that one? Not really. Okay. That's interesting. Uh, we'll keep going. You know, so like that's the kind of attitude we should have. And um, I offer these as a study for you to study alongside with me, to test alongside with me. Um, and to know that I won't have everything right, and I don't ever claim to have everything right. But with that being said, I treat this as if, uh, like, we're all in my living room, uh, just reading the Torah portion, just talking about it, and uh, well, unfortunately, it's a one-way conversation right now. But uh, one day, uh, one day, we'll all be able to gather together, and uh, man, what a what a great time that'll be when we just sit around and talk about the the word. Uh, the whole time. So anyways, um, with that being said, let's uh, let's start with a prayer and um, we'll get started. Heavenly Father, Yahuwah, we come before you in Yahusha's name and we bless you and thank you for allowing us to be reconciled back to you through sending of your son, your word, the logos. Um, we thank you for uh, giving us your commandments that we may do what's right before your eyes and we just ask you to continue to strengthen us and to Teach us every day, every week, that we may learn more of your ways and to do what's right and pleasing in your sight. And we uh, we ask you to, to prune us, to prune our heart, to prune off the impurities, the iniquities off us so that we um, may, be, may be pleasing in your sight. That's what we're looking for. We love you, we bless you, and we thank you for this Shabbat. Amen and amen. And we thank him also for letting us gather on this platform. Um, how much longer that will happen, I don't know. But I'm very thankful, and I hope that, that he allows us to do this until that very last day. But with that being said, let's just do a quick shofar. Just in case. It is kind of late. For those of you who are watching this as a recording, it's uh, it's about t almost 1030 Central. Um, and so I'm going to make sure you're awake. If you're watching this as a recording, well, who knows what time it is.
Man, Psalm 150, verse 6 is one of my favorites. It says, let everything that has breath, not every human being, not every man or woman, but everything that has breath, praise Yahuwah. And there's a, uh, I think it's Psalm, is it Psalm 147, 138? So it's one of the higher up uh, Psalms in number. It talks about how like all the things in creation praises him, like the sun and the moon praises him. Uh, it's just an amazing Psalm. And... Uh, you haven't if you haven't shared the gospel with your uh with your domesticated animal i would uh i'd recommend it because <laughs> it says you know i let everything that has breath praise you it's literally the last verse of the the psalms at least in the uh um the the uh, psalms that we find in the the canon anyways enough uh, of that let's get to the scriptures what you're here for and we'll get to start with Exodus 35, 1, and again we'll be ending at 38, 20. So, And Moshe gathered all the assembly of the children of Yashrael together and said unto them, These are the words which Yahuwah has commanded that you should do them. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day there shall be to you a holy day, a set-apart day, a Kodesh day, um, a Shabbat of rest to you. Whosoever does work thereon shall be put to death. And, you know, people would look at this and be like, you know, but death, yeah, right, you know. Sabbath is obviously done away with. Um, you know, if you're new and you're you're just getting started off with the Sabbath, and, you know, at first it might be a little different because you're probably used to uh, mowing your lawn on, on Saturday. Uh, I call it Saturday. Seven, let's just call it the seventh day. Let's, let's not use pagan terms. So you're used to, you know, shopping on the seventh day or, um, you know, doing this or that. You know, the, the Shabbat, you know, it might be different at, at first, but it ends up being such a blessing to know you have a day each week where it's like, <sighs> praise you <yeah. laughs> Jubilees 2, 222 or 223, I think, depending on the version, but it says that it's a day to eat, to drink, and to bless him who has created all things. Um and what a marvelous day. I think that's something we should do every day. But I, I think, you know, it might be the day that we, since we're not working, we should have more time to do those things, to sing praises to his name. Um, you know, the type of worship he looks for in a lot of ways, it's all throughout the song, is singing him, singing him a song. Um, one of my favorite things to do on Shabbat is to just sit in the backyard on, the, on our backyard porch swing with my guitar. And uh, that's where I like to sing him psalms songs and uh that's where i i've written a lot of uh, music some people say you can't do that on shabbat um i would beg to differ i don't think that's work i think that's praising the most high um but it's man you know when david talks about um my cup runneth over i, I didn't even know what that meant until i picked up a guitar and tried to sing to him and i said and notice i said tried because i <laughs> my singing is is uh, needs some work but um you know I just want to talk a little bit about what, what to do on Shabbat here. Because, again, the rest of this portion really is about the, the building of the tabernacle. Um, I want to talk about what to, what what we can do on Shabbat and what we probably shouldn't do. And, um, you know, it's definitely a day of no work. Uh, it's for your regular employment, don't do it. There's some debate with people whether you, know, you can you know, do chores around the house, laundry. I, I think it's a day to put that down personally. But really at the core of what he's asking you to do is not uh, not to earn an income, not to well, go to work, go work for the, you know, the man or the world. Um, that's a day to, to set apart for Yah. You know, I and I've got a, I've got a busy household. I've got, uh, it's me, my wife, five children, uh, and three of them are, are still, you know, toddler age. Well, my five-year-old's not a toddler. Um, but we still have some diapers, uh, some pull-ups. Um, five children make a mess, you know? And so neither my wife nor I like to live in filth. So, you know, two hours in the living room, the children are making a mess, you know? And so sometimes we like to pick up a little bit. I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. Um, but really the core of it is no working. And it's not a day to buy or sell. And it's not a day to make others work. So, you know, 
you know, some people are like, well, if I go to a restaurant, you know, they're working anyways. It's not a big deal. You know, I don't think we should add to the problem. I think we should be, you know, we should do what Yahweh commands us to do is to not work. And it, in, in the, uh, when he gave the commandments, it was specific, not, not letting your, your employees work, not making your employees work, not even your animals are they supposed to work. Uh, so it's supposed to be just an absolute rest. And, you know, again, at first, it, there's a little bit of transition. And at first you're like, you have no idea what to do. Like, do we, what do we what do I do? Do I just nap all day long? Or, uh, and I know that's what I did at first. I just I was like, this is great. I'm just gonna nap all day long. But remember, the Shabbat is also it's called a holy convocation. And uh, you know, in part, those of you that are watching this live, you know, that's that's uh, kind of a fulfillment of it. Uh, where where two or three are gathered, especially for you all in the uh, chat, um, you're gathered together. Uh, where two or three gathered together, right? Um, the the holy convocation is a a public gathering. It's a public meeting of Yah's people in order to worship, praise, and read the word, and eat. And so the the Shabbat is a holy convocation. So if you have anyone near you, uh, it's a great idea to get together. You know, some would say, ah, uh, you know, you can't do that because you can't travel. Well, you know, that's what I also love about Messiah Yahushua's testimony and his walk is he showed us that that's actually not quite the case. Uh, the only that that commandment comes from um, Jubilees fifty, which uh, you know it says you're not supposed to go on a journey. And I, certainly, I don't think Shabbat is the day to go on a you know on a long trip, or um, it's probably not a day to fl go you know go fly in an airplane or drive cross country. But you know you know driving a little bit to get to a fellowship, not a big deal. Not a big deal in my opinion. Uh, you know. Or show some scripture, Matthew 12, 1 through 12. At that time, Yahushua went on the Sabbath day through the corn, right? So remember, this is the Sabbath day. He went through the corn, and his disciples were hungered and began to pluck in the ears of corn and eat. So here you have Messiah Yahushua traveling via foot. Certainly, that's a lot more work than getting in a car. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. And the interesting part is um, the only thing, you know, the only thing that they could charge him of was oral Torah because it's not it's not unlawful to eat on the Sabbath day. It's not unlawful to walk on the Sabbath day or, or to um, to travel. But he said unto them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungered, and they that were with him, how he entered into the house of Elohim, and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the Torah how on the Shabbat days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple, but if you had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the guilty. For the Son of Man is Adonai even on the Sabbath day. Now that doesn't mean that we're Adonai of the Sabbath day and we can just, you know, do whatever. So keep that in mind. But keep reading. And when he was departed thence, he went into their synagogue, synagogue, and behold, there was a man which had his hand withered, and they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days, that they might accuse him? And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep, and if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, he will not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much, how much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath day. So this kind of this kind of opens it up a little bit. And you know, first of all, there is no Torah against healing on the Shabbat day. So once again, this is a uh, oral tradition. This is a man-made uh, commandment of Elohim that the Pharisees were rebuking Yahusha uh, for breaking. He was openly breaking him, right, just to show them like. Your commandments don't mean anything to me. Not to be a rebel and a punk, but but just to show them that, you know, their laws don't are, are not true. They're not valid. They're not from Yahuwah. Therefore, they don't stand, and they're just commandments and precepts of men. So, but Yahushua healed on the Sabbath day, but he also says, you know, it's lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. You know, uh, there was a point where I was very strict about the Shabbat that, you know, you couldn't, you know, you, you, know, you couldn't do anything. Um, but, you know, as time and as you grow, you learn that, it's, it's good to do well on the Sabbath day. So, like, you know, I had a brother that, that told me about uh, a recent thing where, you know, um, a brother had invited him to go out and go uh, help a helpless man, a homeless man. And, uh, you know, I can't remember exactly what they did, but, you know, for the for the average tour person, they oh, you're breaking Shabbat, you know, because you went and, went and bought something and, and, you know, fed the homeless. You know, I think those things are... are 
lawful to do well in the Shabbat, you know? So like if you can help somebody in the Shabbat, if you, you know, if your neighbor needs you to go over and, um, you know, what if, what if you got an old lady, an elderly lady next to you and, and, um, uh, a pipe bursts in her house or her water he- heater bursts or, or goes out, maybe the, maybe just a pilot light or something goes out and, uh, you know, um, it's in the winter time and she needs heat or something, you know, are you going to say, Oh, I'm sorry, I can't come over. It's the Shabbat. You know, those are the kind of things where I think it's like, Hey, you know, it's lawful to do well in the Shabbat. Um, I, I think at the core of it, we we shouldn't have our, our normal gainful employment where we earn an income on the Shabbat. But, you know, things where you can help your neighbor and be a light to your community, um, if the opportunity presents itself, uh, I think you should do it. I think you should. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of, so I've had, I'm just trying to think, I wish I had had all the questions written down that people have asked me over the years of what we can and can't do on Shabbat. But at the end of the day, uh, I do think it's a day to eat uh, and eat well, you know. Um, I think it's a day to um, eat the best, you know. It's not a day, in my opinion, for, for leftovers. And I know a lot of people uh, get angry and upset with me about that. Um, I do believe it is okay to cook on Shabbat. I don't believe that that's the type of work he's talking about, especially if it's a feast day. Um, I believe it's a, a day for the for the best food, but I don't want to get into that because uh, I know a lot of you get really upset with me about that, and so uh, we don't need to go down that road today. But uh, I do believe it is a day to to feast. It's a day to it's a weekly feast appointment meeting with the Most High. It's a day to to eat well. Um, and again, like a jubilee, I love jubilees. Eat, drink, and bless Him. It's a day to eat, drink, and bless Him who has created all things. And if you can, if you have local fellowship, I think it's a great day to get together, um, to assemble. For those of you that don't, don't have that kind of fellowship, it's also why I try to keep these going every Shabbat so that you can have some sort of fellowship together. It's not perfect, but hey, those of you in there in the chat right now, um, you're assembling, right? There's still no replacement for in-person, handshakes, hugs, sharing a meal together, reading the word together in person, singing songs together. Let me tell you something. It is uh, it is absolutely joyful. But continuing about traveling on Shabbat, I just want to show you uh, that Yahusha did travel on Shabbat. Luke 4, 14 through 16, And Yahusha returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read, for to read. So he had to travel uh, some distance, right, to get to the synagogue. And so for those of you, um, you know, that uh, believe it's not lawful to, you know, go to someone's house or or a congregation to fellowship on Shabbat because you can't travel, I'm here to tell you uh, Messiah Yahushua did, and that's good enough for me. So um, the, that brings us to the next thing. So this is an interesting verse here. Exodus 35, 3, You shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations on the Shabbat. So, you know, I, I also know that a lot of the professions back then, uh, especially, you know, working with metals, and it all required making a fire. You know, I do believe that he spoke of this no kindling fire in the context of work because let's— Let's um, let's imagine this for a second. We know that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath, right? The Sabbath is supposed to be a blessing for us. I often, th- in thinking about this and taking this to its most literal um, f- form, you know, I think about, you know, brothers and sisters that live in the northern part of, uh, of um, the United States, Canada, Alaska, and, um, you know, if they're not able to have fire in their house, to heat their home in the winter, you know, first of all, it can endanger their health. And second of all, that becomes a burden. If I live in those climates, which I don't, but I do live in an area where it gets cold. I mean, this winter that we had that crazy storm, it got negative 15. Um, and we had two foot of snow on the ground. If I couldn't have heat heated, uh, our home on Shabbat, um, that would have been a terrible burden and there would have been no joy in that. And, uh, you know, some would say kindle is the, is the operative word here that, they should already have a fire going because back then it was a lot of work to get a fire started. So some people say, hey, uh, well, what this really means is, you know, it's no fire for work purposes. Some people say, hey, um, well, you're not supposed to just kindle it during Shabbat. You should have it already ready on prep day and just keep it going through Shabbat. 
that's an interesting way to look at it as well. Uh, some people would use this no fire thing. So see, you can't cook, right? Uh, but again, I do believe that that is the context for it is your employment, um, especially the you know. Uh, well, again, I'll drop the the cooking cooking thing, um, but you know, think about this also. So, if we're not supposed to have, you know, um, you know, any kind of fire, so even like like, like a candle. So you're telling me, you know, once the sun goes down, the Most High doesn't want you um, having a candle lit so you can read the scriptures to your family? So these are kind of the, some of the things that I think about and try to understand as to what is actually going on here. And so because people take that literally, you know, Judaism takes it to the extreme. Like you can't drive a car because, you know, there's a, a spark, a flame that's kindling a fire. Uh, they'll even think about a light switch. They're like, okay, well, you know, electricity isn't the fire itself, but you know, what about the, you know, what about uh, the electricity source? Is it is it from coal? You know, so is it, are they burning a fire? So are you contributing to the problem? So it just keeps going and going and going. And so uh, at some point, you have to ask yourself, what is what is this really, you know, referring to? And I do believe that it's, you know, it's in a context of work, not in a context of uh, some of these other things. So at the end of the day, again, you know. The scripture says, uh, where is it? Um, Sabbath is made for man. Mark 2, 27 through 28. And he said unto them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath, right? So it's not supposed to be this just burdensome thing that you you don't look forward to each week. This is something that should be looked forward to each week. So just something to consider with the the context of no kindling of fire through your habitations on the Shabbat, just uh, just something to consider. Okay, let's keep going. So Exodus thirty five four and Moshe spoke unto all the assembly of the children of Yisrael, saying, "This is the thing which Yahweh commanded, saying, Take ye from among you an offering unto Yahweh, whosoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it, an offering of Yahweh, gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen. We're going to talk about linen here in a little bit, and goat's hair and ram skins dyed red." And we talked about this also a few weeks ago. Uh, this We really believe that this means either just blue or violet skins and shittim wood and oil for the light and spices for anointing and for the sweet incense and onyx stones and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastplate. And so we see here this is a willing offering, right? Whoever is willing to do this, uh, a willing heart, let him do it. We saw this in, was it last week's support portion? The week before. And um, he didn't command it, but he's like, hey, Whoever's willing, bring it on over. Remember, they just got made rich by the Egyptians after after leaving. And every wise hearted among you shall come and make all that Yahweh has commanded the tabernacle, his tent, his covering, his tashes, his boards, his bars, his pillars, his sockets, right? This is for you construction minded guys. This is your this is your time to shine right here. The ark and the staves thereof, with the mercy seat and the veil of the covering, the table and his staves and all his vessels and the showbread, and the menorah, and uh, I'm sorry, the seven branch candlestick, also for the light and his furniture and his lamps and the oil for the light and the incense altar and his staves and the anointing oil and the sweet incense and the hanging for the door at the entering of the tabernacle the altar of burnt offering with his brazen grate and his staves and all his vessels and the labor and his foot, the hangings of the court, his pillars and their sockets and the hanging for the door of the court, the pins of the tabernacle and the pins of the court and their cords, the cloths of service to do service in the holy place, holy garments for Aharon the priest and the garments of his sons to minister in the priest's office. And all the assembly of the children of Yashrael departed from the presence of Moshe, and they came, every one whose heart stirred him up, and every one whom his ruach made willing, and they brought Yahweh's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the assembly, and for all his service, and for the holy garments. And they came, both men and women, as many as were willing-hearted, and brought bracelets, and earrings, and rings, and tablets, and all jewels of gold, and every man that offered an offering of gold unto Yahweh. And every man with whom was found blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and red skins of rams and blue or violet skins brought them. Everyone that did offer an offering of silver and brass brought Yahweh's offering and every man with whom was found shittim wood for any work of the service brought it. You know, it's really interesting. I actually didn't even think about this till just now. Um, you know, 
Okay. Uh, I didn't think about this till just now that, uh, you know, so going back on the thought of leaving Egypt and uh, hello, um, they were made rich, but uh, with jewels and gold and silver and all these different things. And, uh, a lot of these things they took from the Egyptians ended up being part of the tabernacle. And it is interesting. I think it's in Isaiah 61. Um, I think it is. Isaiah 61. Um, Yeah, but you shall be named the priests of Yahuwah. Men shall call you the ministers of our Elohim. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and their glory shall you boast yourselves. Um, hmm. There's another passage I'm thinking about, but essentially it says that, uh, oh, here it is. It's in Isaiah 66. That's why. Okay. Here we go. It says, "Shall I?" Uh, this is the birth of the generation and of New Jerusalem. Right, rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad with her, all you that love her. Rejoice for joy with her, all you that mourn for her. And this is the ever everlasting tabernacle of Elohim. This is not the tabernacle in the wilderness. This is the everlasting one, that you may suck and be satisfied with the breasts of her consolations, that you may milk out and be delighted with the abundance of her glory. For thus says Yahweh: Behold, I will extend to her like a river. I'm sorry, extend peace to her like... That was right outside my house. I'll extend peace to her. I hope I didn't flinch like a little baby. I'll extend peace to her like a river. Wow, I saw that one. And the glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream. And then you shall suck and you shall be born upon her sides and be dandled upon her knees. Anyways, what this is basically saying is, um, you know, we're going to be... Um, the, the nations are going to basically... Uh, bring all their riches to um, the Most High and to New Jerusalem, and the righteous will be decked with these things. And uh, I wonder if, uh, you know, New Jerusalem already comes prepared and built. But anyways, I just thought that was kind of interesting parallel of the riches that the that the righteous get leaving Egypt, and it'll kind of the same thing will happen when New Jerusalem comes and that bigger second exodus comes. So just an interesting thought that just came to mind just now. And verse 25 of Exodus 35, And all the women that were wise-hearted did spin with their hands and brought that which they had spun, both of the blue and of the purple and of the scarlet and of the fine linen. And all the women whose hearts stirred them up, uh, I'm sorry, when all the women whose hearts stirred them up in wisdom spun goat's hair, and their rulers brought the onyx stones, and stones to be set for the ephod, and for the breastplate, and spice, and oil for the light, and for the anointing oil, and for the sweet incense. The children of Yashrael brought a willing offering unto Yahuwah, every man and woman whose heart made them willing to bring for all manner of work which Yahuwah commanded to be made by the hand of Moshe. And Moshe said unto the children of Yashrael, See, Yahuwah has called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Horai, the son of Yehuda, of the tribe of Yehuda, and he has filled him with Ruach Elohim in wisdom, in understanding, and in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship, and to devise curious works to work in gold, and in silver, and in brass, and in the cutting of stones to set them, and in the carvings of wood to make any manner of cunning work. And he has put in his heart that he may teach both he and Aholiab, the son of Ahisamak, of the tribe of Dan. Them has he filled with wisdom of heart to work all manner of work of the engraver and of the cunning workman and of the embroider in blue and in purple and scarlet and in fine linen and of the weaver, even of them that do any work and of those that devise cunning work. Chapter 36. Then wrought Bezalel and Aholiab and every wise-hearted man in whom Yahweh put wisdom and understanding to know how to work all manner of work for the service of the sanctuary according to all that Yahweh had commanded. So know that wisdom is not just wisdom in, in scriptures and wisdom in, uh, in teaching the scriptures or whatnot. It's also people that work with their hands, right? So Yahweh can give wisdom and understanding in someone to, to do good work with their hands. 
Verse 2, And Moshe called Bezalel and Aholiab and every wise-hearted man in whose heart Yahuwah had put wisdom, even everyone whose heart stirred him up to come unto the work to do it. And they received of Moshe all the offering which the children of Yashrael had brought for the work of the service of the sanctuary to make it withal. And they brought yet unto him free offerings every morning. And all the wise men that wrought all the work of the sanctuary came every man from his work which they made. And they spoke unto Moshe, saying, The people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which Yahuwah commanded to make. And Moshe gave commandment, and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp, saying, Let neither man nor woman make any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing. So that's that's awesome, right? So they had, they had such a willing heart that, like, they had enough, and they're like, Stop! No more, no more, no more. <laughs> For the stuff they had was sufficient for all the work to make it, and too much. And every white-hearted man among them that wrought the work of the tabernacle made ten curtains of fine twine linen, and blue and purple and scarlet with cherubim of cunning work made he them. The length of one curtain was twenty and eight cubits, and the breadth of one curtain four cubits. The curtains were all of one size. And he coupled the five curtains unto one unto another, and the other five curtains he coupled one unto another. And he made loops of blue on the edge of one curtain from the selvage in the coupling. Likewise, he made the uttermost side of another curtain in the coupling of the second. Fifty loops made he in one curtain, and fifty loops made he in the edge of the curtain which was in the coupling of the second. The loops held one curtain to another. And he made fifty tashes of gold and coupled the curtains one unto another with the tashes, so it became one tabernacle. And he made curtains of goat's hair for the tent over the tabernacle, eleven curtains made he them. He made them. The length of one curtain was thirty cubits, and four cubits was the breadth of one curtain. The eleven curtains were of one size, and he coupled the five curtains by themselves, and six curtain by, curtains by themselves. And he made fifty loops upon the uttermost edge of the curtain in the coupling, and fifty loops made he upon the edge of the curtain which he couples the second. And he made fifty tashes of brass to couple the tent together that it might be one. And he made a covering for the tent of ram skins dyed red, and a covering of blue skins above that. And he made the boards of the tabernacle of shittim wood standing up. The length of a board was ten cubits, and the breadth of, of a board one cubit and a half. One board had two tenons equally distant from one another. Thus did he make for all the boards of the tabernacle. And he made the boards for the tabernacle, twenty boards for the south side southward. And forty sockets of silver he made under the twenty boards, two sockets under one board for his two tenons, and two sockets under another board for his two tenons. And for the other side of the tabernacle, which is toward the north corner, he made twenty boards. And there are forty sockets of silver, two sockets under one board, and two sockets under another board. And for the sides of the tabernacle westward, he made six boards. And two boards made he for the corners of the tabernacle and the two sides. And they were coupled beneath, and coupled together at the head thereof, to one ring. Thus he did to both of them in the both of the corners. And there were eight boards, and their sockets were sixteen sockets of silver, under every board two sockets. And he made bars of shittim wood, five for the boards of the one side of the tabernacle, and five for the, for the boards of the other side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the boards of the tabernacle for the side westward. And he made the middle bar to shoot through the boards from the one end to the other. And he overlaid the boards with gold, and made their rings of gold to be places for the bars, and overlaid the bars with gold. And he made a veil of blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine twine linen, with cherubim made he it of cunning work. And he made thereunto four pillars of shittim wood, and overlaid them with gold. Their hooks were of gold, and he cast them four sockets of silver. And he made a hanging for the tabernacle door of blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine twine linen of needlework, and the five pillars of it with their hooks. And he overlaid their chapiters and their fillets with gold, but their five sockets were of brass. So, you know, there's not a whole lot I can really comment on this. Again, I'm not really a construction-minded guy, so I can't really understand how this is all put together. It just doesn't, doesn't compute with me. But just know that, you know, it's, it's some of the finest materials in the world were made here. You had gold, of course, silver, you had brass, um, you know, it was extremely expensive. It's not like today, you know, to have a blue shirt or, a, a, you know, a blue coat. Um, <laughs> it's, a, you know, it's a dime a dozen. But to have blue and purple and scarlet linen, I mean, this is extremely expensive. These are the hardest colors to get a hold of. And, uh, you know, also, I believe that these are his favorite colors. 
Uh, you've got blue, you've got red, right, scarlet, and when you take blue and red, put them together, you have purple, which is um, you know, in some some would say the the color for royalty. And um, you know that same thing with Aaron's robes, right? Scarlet, blue, purple, just beautiful colors. And I have to think that the Most High, if I had to take a guess, I can't speak for him, I think his favorite color is blue. And it always has been mine too. Um, he just made so many things blue, right? <laughs> that are so abundant. The firmament, the sapphire firmament, that's why it's blue. The the water, it reflects off of that, that's why it looks blue. Um, there's probably a lot more I'm thinking, I can think of. Uh, the blue jay, how about the blue jay, right? <laughs> and you got the cardinal, you know, the two prettiest birds, you know, the, the blue and red, two favorite colors. Anyways, just uh, just some side commentary again. I thought that there's really much you can glean from that. But uh, Exodus 37. And Bezalel made the Ark of Shittim wood. Two cubits and a half was the length of it, and a cubit and a half the breadth of it, and a cubit and a half the height of it. And he overlaid it with pure gold within and without, and made a crown of gold to it round about. And he cast for it four rings of gold to be set by the four corners of it, even two rings upon the one side of it and two rings upon the other side of it. And he made staves of shittim wood and overlaid them with gold. And he put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark to bear the ark. And he made the mercy seat of pure gold, two cubits and a half was the length thereof, and one cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And he made two cherubim of gold beaten out one of the, I'm sorry, beaten out of one piece he made them. On the two ends of the mercy seat, one cherub on the on the end of this side, and another cherub on the other side, on that side. So, again, just a quick little idea. So you have the cherub on this side, that side, and this is roughly what it looks like. Nobody really exactly knows, but just a rough idea. And the cherubim spread out their wings on high, and covered with their wings over the mercy seat, with their faces one to another, even to the mercy seat seatward were the faces of the cherubim and he made the table of shittim wood two cubits was the length thereof and a cubit the breadth thereof and a cubit and a half the height thereof and he overlaid it with pure gold and made thereunto a crown of gold round about also he made thereunto a border of a hand breadth round about and made a crown of gold for the border thereof round about and he cast for it four rings of gold and put the rings upon the four corners that were in the feet thereof over against the border were the rings, the places for the staves to bear the table. And he made the staves of shittim wood, and overlaid them with gold to bear the table. And he made the vessels which were upon the table, his dishes, his spoons, his bowls, and his covers to cover with all of pure gold. And he made the menorah, the seven branch candlestick. Of pure gold, of beaten work, made he the menorah, his shaft, and his branches, his bowls, his knops, his flowers were of the same, and six branches going out of the sides thereof, three branches of the menorah on the one side thereof, and three branches of the menorah on the other side thereof, three bowls made after the fashion of almonds in the one branch, a knop and a flower, and three bowls made like almonds in another branch, and a knop and a flower, so throughout the six branches going out of the menorah. And in the menorah were four bowls made like almonds, his knops and his flowers, and a knop under two branches of the same, and a knop under two branches of the same, and a knop under two branches of the same, according to the six branches going out of it. Their knops and their branches were of all the same, all of it was of one beaten work of pure gold. And he made his seven lamps and his snuffers and his snuff dishes of pure gold. Of a talent of pure gold made he it, and all the vessels thereof. So this is a, this is a heavy, this was... A talent. A talent is like seventy-five pounds, right? So, I mean, this is a this is no small candlestick. So, speaking of talent and being seventy-five pounds, I just it reminded me of a, a scripture in, in Revelation. Revelation sixteen twenty-one reads, "And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent." Right, so he had hail the size of seventy-five pounds, and men blasphemed Elohim because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. I mean, that's instant death. Seventy-five pounds from the sky hits you, you're dead. It's over. Continuing Exodus thirty-seven twenty-five, and he made the incense altar of shittim wood. The length of it was a cubit, and the breadth of it was a cubit. It was four square, and two cubits was the height of it. The horns thereof were of the same. And he overlaid it with pure gold, both the top of it and the sides thereof round about, and the horns of it also he made it unto a crown of gold round about. 
and he made two rings of gold for it under the crown thereof, by the two corners of it upon the two sides thereof, to be places for the staves to bear it withal. And he made the staves of shittim wood, and overlaid them with gold. And he made the holy anointing oil, and the pure incense of sweet spices, according to the work of the apothecary. <clears throat> Exodus 38, 1. And he made the altar of burnt offering of shittim wood. Five cubits was the length thereof, and five cubits the breadth thereof. It was four square, and three cubits the height thereof. And he made the horns thereof on the four corners of it. The horns thereof were of the same, and he overlaid it with brass. And he made all the vessels of the altar, the pots, and the shovels, and the basins, and the flesh hooks, and the fire pans, all the vessels thereof he made of brass. And he made for the altar a brazen grate of network under the compass thereof beneath it to the midst of it. And he cast four rings for the four ends of the grate of brass to be places for the staves. And he made the staves of shittim wood and overlaid them with brass. And he put the staves into the rings on the sides of the altar to bear it withal. And he made the altar hollow with boards. And he made the laver of brass and the foot of it of brass and the, the, the looking glasses of the women assembling, which assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the assembly. That's interesting. The looking glasses of the women. What does that say in the in the King Jimmy Exodus thirty eight eight? Looking glasses. Oh, why didn't I see this earlier? Huh. Feminine vision, also a mirror, looking glass, vision. Vision. Hmm. Interesting. All right. So he made the labor of brass, and the foot of it was brass, and the looking glasses of the women assembling the vision. Is it like, is it like spectacles? Which assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the assembly. <clears throat> And he made the court on the south side southward. The hangings of the court were of fine twined linen, a hundred cubits. We're going to talk about linen here just to finish it up in a second. Their pillars were twenty, and their brazen sockets twenty. The hooks of the pillars and their fillets were of silver. And for the north side, the hangings were a hundred cubits. Their pillars were twenty, and their sockets of brass twenty. The hooks of the pillars and their fillets of silver. And for the west side were hangings of fifty cubits. Their pillars ten, and their sockets ten. The hooks of the pillars and their fillets of silver. And for the east side, eastward, 50 cubits. The hangings of the one side of the gate were 15 cubits. Their pillars three and their sockets three. And for the other side of the court gate, on this hand and on that, were hangings of 15 cubits, their pillars three and their sockets three. And all the hangings of the court round about were of fine twined linen. And the sockets for the pillars were of brass, and the hooks of the pillars, and their fillets of silver, and the overlaying of their chapters of silver, and all the pillars of the court were filleted with silver. And the hanging for the gate of the court was needlework of blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine twined linen. And twenty cubits was the length, and the height in the breadth was five cubits, answerable to the hangings of the court. And their pillars were four, and their sockets of brass four, their hooks of silver, and the overlaying of their chapters, and their fillets of silver. And all the pins of the tabernacle and of the court round about were of brass. So, a couple things. So we saw linen mentioned here a ton, a ton, quite a few times. And we know that the Most High used the best, best things here. So, there's an interesting study that was done. It doesn't look like it's going to pull up. But, you know, as we learned where the Most High is like, hey, don't eat pork. It's an abomination. Well, even even science, modern day science will tell you that pork is terrible for you. It's toxic, um, and it just destroys your body. So the most high, <clears throat> most high is looking out for us. Linen is the best fabric you can wear. Uh, actually, well, linen is the the pinnacle of fabrics found in the plant world, and wool is the pinnacle of um, fibers or clothing that you can find. In the animal world but the problem is so here let's uh, just show you this real quick <clears throat> I'll just read this for you. I know I read this before in a different study but 
I know there's always new people, so I'm going to share this. In 2003, a study was done by a Jewish doctor, Heidi Yellen, on the frequencies of fabric. According to this study, the human body has a signature frequency of 100. It's like a baseline. And organic, organic cotton is the same, 100. The study showed that if the number is lower than 100, it puts a strain on the body. A diseased, nearly dead person has a frequency of about 15. And that is where polyester, rayon, and silk register. So what this is saying is that if you're wearing polyester now i'm getting i'm trying i'm starting to get rid of all my polyester clothes um some of my it's unfortunate some of my favorite clothes are polyester but if you if you wear polyester rayon silk it takes away from your energy it like drains you it's like it's like you know if you ever got to your car with a dead battery because something drained it all night um, that's kind of what's happening to your body non-organic cotton registers a signature frequency of about 70 However, if the fabric has a higher frequency, it gives energy to the body. This is where linen comes in as a super fabric. Its frequency is 5,000. Wool is also 5,000, but when mixed together with linen, the frequencies cancel each other out and fall to zero. Even wearing a wool sweater on top of a linen outfit in a study collapsed the electrical field. The reason for this could be that the energy field of wool flows from left to right, while that of the linen flows in opposite direction from left to right. You know, I just actually noticed this. Um, when I wear polyester, every time I if, if you think about this, if you have a polyester shirt or like sweatshirt or jacket, when you take it off, it's you got the static, right? It's like, and you have like your hair sticks up and whatnot. It's because it was literally draining your body of energy, and it's like attached to the to the fabric. It's it's amazing. Um, so it, what's interesting about this though is the two super fabrics is um, linen and wool. But when mixed together, they cancel each other out. And what's amazing is you can find that in your scriptures. Leviticus 19.19, You shall keep my statutes. You shall not let your cattle gender with a diverse kind. You shall not sow your field with mingled seed. Neither shall a garment mingled of linen and wool and come upon you. Right? He's like, don't mix linen and woolen. Don't do it. Now we know it's because it's, it's terrible for you. Because when, five, when plus 5,000 and negative 5,000 come together, you have zero, which is actually worse than polyester. So if you have a fabric mixed with linen and wool together, it's actually worse than polyester or silk or rayon. Because that actually has a signature of 15, if, if that study is true, which I do believe it is. Deuteronomy 22, 11 through 12, Thou shalt not wear a garment of diverse sorts as of woolen and linen together. Since we're here, then thou shalt, thou shalt make the fringes or zitzit upon the four quarters of thy vesture wherewith thou covers thyself. So uh, something really interesting. So um, I have one, actually, I've got two pairs of linens. Um, and let me tell you something. It's pro it might just be my mind, but I thoroughly enjoy every time I wear linens. Um, I really, really do. Uh, I'm actually wearing them right now. And um, there's just a healing property about it. There's something just nice about wearing linen. And I've never, ex uh, I've never experienced it before. So uh, it's unfortunate. It's actually very expensive to switch over. Um, and so I, I haven't, what I have done in the meantime is I'm trying to get rid of all my polyester clothes and replace it with at least cotton, hundred percent cotton clothes. Um, it's hard for me to even find hundred percent, uh, organic cotton clothes, but, um, I, I, you know, I, I am glad to know that you can get hundred percent cotton jeans. That's nice. Cause I do like wearing jeans. And also I was like, Oh no, jeans, what's jeans made out of? Probably polyester. But I was glad to see that. Um, jeans are actually, most jeans are made out of 100% cotton. So uh, just something to think about, you know. It, this is one of those one of those Torah statues where people laugh and mock at you and say, ah, you're, you're not going to wear, you know, a uh, uh, mixed, you know, mixed threaded, you know, shirt. And be like, yeah, actually, no, I don't want to because the Torah says no. But, uh, you know, even uh, you know, certain studies will show you that um, it's actually not good for your health, you know. So uh, anyways, so... So some things to think about. Uh, again, interesting portion. Not a whole lot to talk about uh, as far as the meat of it, which is really it was the building of the tabernacle. Uh, and uh, we have one more week in Exodus next week, and then we're in Leviticus. Where is this year going? Join me in prayer, brothers and sisters, as we conclude this. Heavenly Father, Yahuwah, we, we just come before you in Yahusha's name, and we bless you for sending your word for us that we may have reconciliation and life through you. And we just thank you for Shabbat and for all that you do and provide for us for making this beautiful world for us to dwell in. And we just pray that we be ready for the return of Messiah Yahushua, whenever that may be. And yeah, in his name we do pray and bless you. I mean, so 
Um, let's do the ironic blessing. Yevarechecha <clears throat> Yahuwah veYish merecha Ya er Yahuwah pana velecha vechuneka Yesa Yahuwah pana velecha veYasim. Lecha shalom. So Yahweh will bless you and keep you. Yahweh will make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Yahweh will lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom, give you peace. Good seeing you, brothers and sisters. And uh, we'll see you next week for week 23, the last week of uh, of Exodus. So uh, with that, we're going to end with just a few songs. And uh, have a blessed Shabbat. Enjoy it. I sing to Yahuwah, for He is highly exalted. The horse and its rider He has thrown into the sea. Yah is my strength and song, and He has become my deliverance. He is my El, and I praise Him. Elohim of my Father And I exalt Him Yahuwah is a man of battle Yahuwah is His name He has cast Pharaoh's chariots And His army into the sea and his chosen officers are drowned in the sea of reeds. The depths covered them. They went down to the bottom like a stone. Your right hand, O oh Yahuwah, has become great in power. Your right hand, O oh Yahuwah, has crushed the enemy. And in the greatness of your excellence, you pulled down those who rose up against you. You sent forth your wrath. It consumed them like stubble. And with the wind of your nostrils, the waters were heaped up The floods stood like a wall The depths became stiff In the heart of the sea The enemy said, I pursue, I overtake I divide the spoil My being is satisfied on them I draw out my sword, my hand destroys them you blew with your wind the sea covered them they sank like lead in the mighty waters who is like you oh Yahuwah among the mighty ones who is like you great Kodesha, awesome in praises, working wonders. You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. In your kindness, you led the people whom you have redeemed. In your strength, you guided them to your Kodesh dwelling. Peoples heard, they trembled. Anguish gripped the inhabitants of Pelasheth. Then the chiefs of Edom were troubled, the mighty men of Moab. Trembling grips them all the inhabitants of Canaan. Melted.
Fear and dread fell on them by the greatness of your arm. They are as silent as a stone. Until your people pass over, oh, Yahuwah. Until the people whom you have bought pass over. You bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, in the place, oh, Yahuwah. Which you have made for your own dwelling, the meek dash, O Yahuwah, which your hands have prepared. Yahuwah reigns forever and ever. Blind to see you are the mind. 